what you choose to do to make a living doesn't define you. And so the most important thing to remember is that it's, it's the journey that's important. On this episode, I was privileged and honored to have a wide-ranging conversation with my two brothers, Peter and Chris. Collectively, the three of us have 85 plus years of experience formally in education as teachers and administrators, and we covered topics from Waldorf education to academic rigor to the role of love and spirituality in education, should those exist or not. Uh, we had some laughs along the way. We even dropped some names of the most influential teachers that have been formative in our lives. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did recording it in La Ventana, Mexico, Baja California Sur. Welcome to the Superintendent's Hangout, where we discuss topics in education, charter schools, life in general, and not necessarily in that order. I'm your host, Dr. Sharetta. Come on in and hang out. Welcome, uh, Pete and Chris. Thank you for coming and hanging out uh, on the Superintendent's Hangout for a little bit this e fine evening in La Ventana, Mexico. This episode is going to be a little more focused on career and education and experience and philosophy than the other one that we recorded um, that's also going to air on this podcast. Um, and so, but doesn't mean we can't take some sideways detours into um, to our upbringing and other things, but we're going to, I'm going to try to keep this a little more focused on career stuff. Um, you guys ready to go? Let's do it. Yep. All right. Rock and roll. Uh, I'd like to start out where Terry Gross always starts out with a very simple question that's not always an easy question, and it is, tell me about yourself. So let's narrow that a little bit, and tell me about yourself in relation to education, and specifically from an educator standpoint. So whoever wants to take that first. Because collectively we have about 85 years of experience in formal education um, as practitioners in one capacity or another. And so, um, you know, why don't we, Chris, why don't we start with you and you can tell okay. us about your 25 years or so and what that looked like and, and we'll go from there. Sure. So my primary interest has always been uh, the natural world. And as a child, I spent as much time as I could outside, um, in the woods, in the, in the creek, by our house, exploring. And, um, and I always figured I would go into science in some form. I had a dream of being a marine biologist. And um, I continued with that into my own schooling and majored in biology in college and found myself going to education after college. It just felt like a natural fit. I had been camp counselor and worked with young people in various settings. Um, okay, tell us that a little time. Bit, yeah, tell us about that. Uh, I know you worked at uh, an outdoor school in the uh, near San Diego, right? Near Hammett? That's, that's right, yeah. In Mountain Center, California. Um, and I also worked in Massachusetts um, as an outdoor educator. So that was right after college. And um, did that for a little while and then ended up in Japan teaching English, um, conversational English for a little over a year, and then came back to the States and went back to school for my master's degree in conservation biology. Um, I th thought that that would lead me out of education, but it never really happened. I found myself coming back to education once again, and this time 
um, worked my way up to teaching high school science in a private school in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And um, I did that up until this past year. Um, and so my journey to that was not perfectly straight. And, um, you know, I did other things in between, but it was always working with young people in an educational setting of some kind. Um, and now I'm at a place where I'm not sure if I will continue with education, um, at least not in a school setting, but I can't imagine that I won't go back to some form of education, but I, it's hard for me to know what the future will bring which is kind of exciting actually yeah it's a liberating thing pete and i were just talking about that a little bit uh what's what lessons have you drawn from the creek or as our stepdad would call it the crick uh that was that ran near our house on uh, hungry hollow road shout out to spring valley then became chestnut ridge um but i remember as a kid you were always any free moment i actually remember summer jobs we would be, you know, we all worked summer jobs, and your, one of your criteria was it had to be outdoors. And, um, yeah. and so, <laughs> you know, yeah. what lessons, what through threads have you brought from those days uh, four or more decades ago all the way up through uh, master's degree and then Japan, which must have been a different experience, and then to the present? Yeah, that's a really good question. The first thing that comes to mind is being able to become so familiar with a natural environment and its inhabitants that you just feel like you know it intimately and it's almost part of you. And um, being able to know what that feels like, be familiar with that and take that into other aspects of your life. Um, into other natural environments and maybe um, not so natural environments, but that's sort of a touchstone going forward in your life. It was for me. How, how do you handle or think about this phenomenon of romanticizing the natural world? So, you know, if, you, if we look at how people interact with the natural world now, let's just say in the United States, there's a lot of selfies. There's a lot of, um, you know, oh, that, oh, that brown bear is so cute. Um, oh, oh, that elk is, oh my gosh, look how beautiful it is. I, if I could only just get much closer, this much closer, I could get an even better photo. Um, uh, I can't imagine, you know, hunting. I can't imagine all these things. There's this romanticizing that happens. And the natural world is, is unsentimental or non-sentimental, I don't know what the word is, and fierce, right? It's, we, you know, here we're recording and we're on the Sea of Cortez in, in Baja, and, you know, this morning as we went uh, down the beach, there's carcasses of animals, uh, fish and different things, and one fish eating another fish and birds eating that fish, and um, and it's not, there's nothing sentimental about it. It's, it is really survival of the fittest. And I think there was a, some, some, uh, somewhere in literature, they talk about the tooth and the claw and that, that that's, that's what the natural world is. How do you bring that understanding to your students, but also have them have an appreciation for and a love for and a stewardship for nature? Does that, uh, does that question make sense? Yeah, I think so. So that last piece is the most important. It's, it's the, the connection. And, and ro over-romanticizing nature is a sign of our disconnection with it. Um, and so trying to foster that, that connection, um, starting with an interest, um, an interest in learning about about the natural world is is really the key. So E.O. Wilson, the famous entomologist, had this, he coined this concept 
of biophilia, which is um, an innate love for all living things that we humans have. And um, it, I don't think anybody can argue that we don't have this. This is why we keep pets. This is why we have we, plants in our homes and why well, we follow cats on Instagram. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is why the shape of, you know, a palm leaf is beautiful to us. Um, so we have this because we need, we are part of the natural world, everything in it we need. Um, if, if spiders, this is something that comes from um, the world of entomology as well, that entomologists say and um, believe this fully, even though it's incredibly difficult to fathom, uh, this fact that if spiders were to disappear today, um, all humans would be gone within one month off the face of the earth. And whoa. this is... Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Pause. Yeah. whoa pause hold on. on that. Whoa. Yeah. I think I just stepped on a spider walking <laughs> yeah. in here. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, there's a spider in my cup. That happens, <laughs> and, you know, my cup of coffee to, has a spider. You know, sometimes get rid of them from places they shouldn't be. But, but spiders... Because of the whole one. chain of... Yeah, exactly. Wow. So spiders are incredibly important keystone species, and we don't realize it, but you know they're helping to control insect populations. Insects are incredibly... I mean, they are the most successful um, group of organisms the world has ever seen, and if they're not controlled, everything would just fall apart. And we, we just, we, we so easily think we're superior. We Pick think we're separate. At the yeah, home, we think we can control things, um, <laughs> but we can only control things so much. And um, we are fully, fully dependent on all the things around us in the natural world, as insignificant as we have come to think they are. So, um, so un just understanding this and understanding how we are all connected and understanding how ecosystems work is really, really important for students um, at the high school level in particular. And so how do, you, how do you foment that or how do you cultivate that in, in students who, due to no, no fault of their own, but their, a lot of their connection in nature um, you know, even even at the food end is is from the supermarket. They're not even seeing, you know, their kids who don't know where eggs come from, right? Or you know, um, uh, same with, with 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 vegetables and every and you know, there's a real disconnect there. And how do you take? I, I understand in an out, in an outdoor school where kids are sent to your outdoor school because it's something that sixth grade camp is, is part of the curriculum or what, what have you and they spend five days and they go walk around the woods and do night hikes and pick up owl scat and all that stuff yeah. that, and that there's value in that but then but how do you do that more comprehensively and globally and not only with students but but also with adults like within the school community yeah well I haven't really worked with adults um, but you, you have colleagues, way. right? Like, so how do they, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, th with the students, I took every opportunity to teach classes outdoors, um, where it's easier to see the, the things you're talking about. Um, I taught a course every year in which we followed, um, the Santa Fe river from not its source exactly, but near its source up in the mountains um, outside of Santa Fe down to its confluence with the Rio Grande and studied uh, different habitats along the river as well as um, different ways in which humans were impacting the environment. Um, sources of water supply for Santa Fe. We would visit the wastewater treatment plant that's along the river um, and get a tour of the facility. Sometimes visited um, the uh, Buckman Direct Diversion Plant, which pulls water from the Rio Grande 
to supplement the needs of Santa Fe and things like that. So, so that was one course, but in many others, I tried to take the students outside as much as possible. And also, there are so many wonderful things written about the natural world, so many great writers, scientists who have really gone deep into the ecology of different areas. And so I, I would um, bring as much of the really good writing to the students and um, just snippets of, of books. And we, we would always read um, Silent Spring. Rachel Carson. Carson. Rachel Carson's work, which most people credit with beginning um, the environmental movement, actually, even though there were things happening before that. That's really what kick-started it. And still today, um, people will credit her with that. So, um, yeah, just just basically trying to expose the students to as much as possible that's relevant, and um, some of it would really click, or that that's the hope. Yeah, that's you know, in a second, Pete. I'm gonna. Um, hop to you on that same question but before that Chris how do you think about and deal with the this notion that environmental stewardship or being an environmentalist is a left-wing liberal tree hugger crunchy <laughs> wear Birkenstocks yeah. and <laughs> shower very sparsely <laughs> kind of a thing you know, you know what I'm talking about right like yeah like, absolutely um <laughs> And and how do you how do you address that in a way that that all students and people from all backgrounds can appreciate you know this this notion of stewardship and connection to nature? Yeah, that's a tough one because it's it's really a political problem um, instead of an environmental problem, and the students, high school students, don't see it that way at all. Right. Right. Uh, Every high school student through an ecology course in 11th grade, let's say that's where I, I taught an ecology course in the curriculum, every 11th grade student will, will come to a place <clears throat> where they see the importance of environmental work. And, um, and it's only later on when, unfortunately, we do get jaded, we are our lives change, our priorities change, um, money becomes a really big thing that everybody worries about, the economy become, you know, becomes the most important thing, and, and people forget, I think, quite honestly. So it's about, I guess, reminding, reminding people. Everybody, everybody depends on... Um, Spiders. Everybody depends on spiders. Everybody depends on a healthy uh, watershed, right? If, if if there's no clean water to drink, um, that doesn't only impact, um, you know, people on the left. So, um, and and actually, because the economic side is the most impactful, that's usually where where things happen when people realize the the economic side of things you know that's why um, ecotourism for instance has been really successful in some places once people realize that the natural resources are super valuable in a monetary sense as well as as in, uh, the ecosystem services that you can't monetize then things start to improve shout out to costa rica that's right and other places totally yeah. and and just yeah. With swimming, I mean, the idea of swimming with the fishes, when we grew up in New Jersey, we thought that was different with the Sopranos than what, what swimming with the fishes we is. We actually but, grew up in New York. But that's okay. <laughs> oh, that's Close right. Close to the border. Stone's but, right, throw. Right. Stone's throw. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was waiting when the jokes were going to start. So <laughs> thank you, Chris, for, for, um, for that thoughtful response. And Pete, I'm going to ask you the same question to tell us uh, where you come from in an educational and from an educator sense. Yeah. So I come from New York, not New Jersey, not New Jersey. Uh, in an environmental sense. Um, but I, so, so my passion was, was 
to be a teacher. And when I was in middle school, that's all I wanted to do. Um, and I realized that uh, I completed college and then went ahead and jumped into a classroom in Akron, Ohio, which was which which is a city where the sort of we all know it for LeBron James now, but and tires and tires and right tires preceded LeBron, yeah. and so kind of the cultural and. Um, success of the city had left with the tire industry that moved overseas so it was pretty um uh, economically yeah. yeah yeah depressed place to to be anyway started at a waldorf school there we're gonna, and, and sorry i don't yeah, mean to interrupt go you ahead. we're going to come back to the waldorf uh topic a little bit later because this has been peppered throughout a number mm -hmm. of my episodes and we'll come back to waldorf education more more thoroughly in a minute so yeah okay continue. okay so i just i i completed well so i was there for two years in akron ohio during which time i entered a waldorf teacher training course that uh, ran over three years and then following that i relocated to new jersey princeton new jersey uh, which is where i also joined a waldorf school there k through eight and spent my next fifth, 17 years really kind of getting thoroughly, deeply entrenched in education. And uh, that was on the East Coast, of course. And then from there, moved to Santa Fe in 2013 and also joined a Walder School community, the Santa Fe Walder School then. Um, and that was, that was my journey. So the only time I was teaching in a non Walder setting was when I was taking college courses, uh, which were limited um, in my junior and senior year of college. So I want to talk a little bit in more depth about Waldorf education. Um, the episode where our mom, Kay Hoffman, um, uh, where she talked about Waldorf education, she gives kind of more of a history. Um, and clearly this is something that's kind of fil filtered or um, I should say, entrenched in our family to varying various degrees. Um, we all attended Waldorf schools, and um, most of our children have as well, et cetera, um, across the four of us in our family. I'll, I'll, I'll put this to you, Pete, before we get to Chris. Um, if you could encapsulate, um, and, you know, you're in an elevator, and uh, you're wearing a a shirt that says Waldorf on it, and people are like, oh, the salad. No, actually, no. Oh, <laughs> the expensive hotel. What's your answer before you get to the 50th floor of the hotel? What do you, what do you, like, why Waldorf for you career-wise, first of all? Yeah, it's a good question, and we're going up. We're going up. Ding, ding, ding. Waldorf. Fourth floor. I, the reason I chose Waldorf Education was because it had given me a platform um, through the development of capacities within myself and a multifaceted approach to the world that gave me confidence and hope in human beings and Tenth floor <laughs> and moving <laughs> forward. So the idea of developing capacities rather than filling kind of an empty jar, empty vessel was, was, um, you know, it brought me and pulled me in and, and was something I wanted to then, give to others through my work in education. So that's why, that's why Waldorf education and ding, 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 ding. You have arrived at the presidential suite. In the Waldorf it's in Astoria. The, it's in the <laughs> motel, in motel six. <laughs> motel six. <laughs> You're on the sixth floor of the motel. Uh, Chris, what about you? Why Waldorf? Well, for me, I guess it was maybe a little bit different because I never thought I was going into education um, throughout my college years. And then again, um, in my graduate studies. So, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, we think, oh, you make a career choice. Uh, we use those words. And sometimes things just happen and you go with it. And I, I feel like that's how it was for me. Um, uh, the Waldorf community was was really familiar. It felt really good, it, and 
um, I enjoyed I enjoyed working there. Um, the teaching was always challenging and interesting, and always required um, flexibility on my part. And the students were were really wonderful. So, um, so that's that's why I did it and. Um, yeah, it, it was a positive experience in that way. In terms of um, my own children, who I did send to the Waldorf School for several years, um, if you ask that question, why Waldorf, I could just see that it was a, a good environment for them. And, um, you know, there are always pros and cons to any situation, and there were in, in the Waldorf School, in, at least in our particular Waldorf School, for my kids, but I could I could tell that it was healthy for them, and um, it was yeah. It, they were allowed to be kids. They were allowed to be kids, and you know we know how precious childhood is, and when we push students in certain ways that don't allow them to be truly kids at the particular age that they are. Um, I think that that's, that's really sad. So, um, so yeah, Waldorf tries to, tries to bring the appropriate setting, the appropriate, um, teaching style, learning style, appropriate experiences, the appropriate stories, pictures, everything at the particular age that the students are at the particular particular developmental stage that they are that's kind of at the center of it um knowing what is appropriate i mean that's that's the difficulty perhaps um that but that's that's what uh that's what waldorf schools have have tried to do have been trying to do all these years so you both talked about what you hope to see you know you Pete, you talked consciously about a choice, and you were trained as a Waldorf teacher. Chris, you were yours was more a, perhaps a, the career chose you as opposed to the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, and we could, you know, go on about um, <clears throat> other benefits to the education. Uh, what's what do you think is something that you believe that? Um, needs to change in Waldorf education um, going forward. Um, this isn't meant to be a criticism, um, uh, but rather a constructive idea, thoughts about education in the future. Because I have a number of them, but I don't want to, I don't want to throw those out there yet. I want to see what you guys have to say. Yeah, well, I think that's a totally appropriate question because uh, we know that there are we know that there are issues and and the Santa Fe Waldorf School uh, is recently, no more. It, that's right yeah. so it closed its doors in August and and that is why I no longer um, am a Waldorf teacher or a teacher at all at this point and um, so I, there are a number of things I think the biggest is is proper leadership uh, that has been lacking in a lot of Waldorf schools and was in particular in our school, in the Santa Fe Waldorf School. Is there a structural uh, reason for that, like in general in Waldorf schools, that makes it distinct from uh, perhaps traditional public schools or uh, a Catholic school or something? Yeah, there are. I, I think there are things that Waldorf schools have in common, and then there are, are of course, lots of differences between the schools, um, but one commonality is that a lot of Waldorf schools are trying to work off of a model. Or they, they think they're working off of a model established, you know, 100 years ago and when the first Waldorf school was started. And um, in 1919. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> And models have to change because 
times change, people change, organizations change. Um, and so, so that, I think that's part of it, but also just this belief, I mean, in, in Waldorf education, when things become entrenched and then there's like a blind, um, uh, what's the right word? It's it just a, a blind following of a particular um, idea and everybody thinks that's the way it has to be when that idea was just one of many that was tried out in former times in the past, then then you have a problem. And, and especially when nobody knows why. Do you have a specific example of that? Um, yeah, yeah. So Pete will know about this more, but um, a specific example is that the consensus model of decision-making had to be the only one used in a Waldorf school. And so this was an idea that was brought at some point by somebody somewhere in a Waldorf school, and it came from the Quaker movement. Correct. And um, and then this caught on, and so Waldorf schools, you know, people at Waldorf schools thought that this was the only way. And so like in a faculty meeting or something. In a faculty meeting. Yeah, and and you know, also the the idea that the faculty would run the school. I mean, I think that that's that that statement um, can be misconstrued. It can be interpreted in a lot of different ways, and I think um, it was taken to the extreme in a lot of schools where the where only the teachers could make the decisions, and every decision had to be um, taken to the teachers and. Um, there are a lot of different ways that the teachers can in, can be involved in, quote unquote, running the school without having to um, be in control of every decision. So that those are just a couple examples. Uh, Pete, what what do you think? Either about that or just in general, something that you'd like to see change or think needs to change yeah. uh, in the future. Yeah. So so. Um, good. Well, that's yeah, the good question. I would say first and foremost, we need accredited and competent uh, teacher training facilities for Waldorf teachers. We need to be able to develop capable, well-educated teachers to go into the Waldorf teaching force. Uh, unfortunately, I think what what has happened all too often is that. There's been a shortage of Waldorf teachers, and so the teacher training facilities for Waldorf education uh, accept anybody who walks through the door. And then there's not necessarily a stringent enough uh, process through which those teachers who are not competent or shouldn't be in front of students are weeded out. Therefore, anybody who's willing is able to enter the classroom. We saw that, I saw that in uh, Ohio, I saw that in New Jersey, and I saw that in New Mexico, where uh, incompetent teachers, very willing, wonderful human beings, got in a classroom and they had no business going there. And just a quick tie-in was we experienced in in our educational uh, situation at the Walther School that we attended, Green Meadow Walther School in Spring Valley, also Chestnut Ridge, New York, that some of the teachers were brilliant, capable, dynamic, but were not actually trained educators and or were not good teachers. So that information that needs to go from teacher to student and the dynamic and relationship between student and, and teacher has to be solid. Uh, and then there needs to be a way to vet that, like I said, in, in practice as well. And because we have this consensus model also, you don't necessarily have enough of a top-down situation going on where people are weeded out and then sentimentality, like you were speaking about with nature, uh, over sentimentality comes in and you realize, oh, this person's striving, they're a really good, kind human being, and they don't end up leaving the classroom uh, of when they should, but instead things just get worse and worse and usually come to a head. So I'd say... Poorly educated teachers and facilities going in. We have the structural leadership issue. 
And then also there's some cultural elements as well. And just a quick one is why does a Waldorf school have to have, uh, you know, the, the aesthetics be less than par or the functionality of a campus be less than par? Why not invest in the infrastructure of the actual school to create an environment of positivity and 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 beauty and functionality for everyone involved. Now, we had a beautiful school in Santa Fe, but there was also a lot that could have been done to make people feel more welcomed uh, and for it not to appear to be different than what expectations were, especially when families are paying hefty tuition. I have a lot of questions about well, thank you both for those that commentary. I have a lot of questions about academic rigor. We'll get there a little bit later. Um, equity and access for uh, a cross section of society uh, that can't afford uh, tuition. We'll talk about that. Uh, but I want to get. I want to ask you a question about spirituality. <clears throat> so, you know, a lot of. Catholic schools, for example, nowadays, um, as opposed to 50 years ago, they're not taught by priests and nuns, right? It's it's lay persons, and they may be Catholic, they may not, um, they may be practicing or not. Um, uh, Waldorf education has a spiritual underpinning um, at, that was at its founding, um, in the person of Rudolf Steiner and anthroposophy. Um, what do you guys see as the role, if any, of that in today's Waldorf schools? Uh, and is it even important in the future? And then the second part of that is, um, uh, are there challenges to having that be part of a school community? That may either may seem weird or off-putting or may um, attract families to the school for things other than a quality education. So there's kind of two parts to that. What's the role and then should it even be that way and what are some of the impacts? So anthroposophy. And uh, don't worry about if you're gonna get canceled by the uh, North American Anthroposophical Society. What about the good on them? <laughs> so it may happen and it's just, it, if, if, we're, if this is education about freedom, Part of freedom means being able to talk about things, so um, they can email me. So, uh, Pete, why don't you take that? Yeah, one? boy. So, so challenges definitely exist. That was also an attractant, I believe, for people uh, to attend the Walder School. The element of a spiritual impulse that was present, recognized, accepted in the school, um, although it's not religious per se. Yeah. Right there is the element of spirituality and you know i always this is kind of a little bit of a tangent here but i always think of you know our legal tenders all the money we have in our wallet at least in the u.s says in god we trust right so we're using legal tender that actually has in god we trust written on it nobody has a problem with that as long as they have enough money in their pocket right um we have the element i always i always say that there's this the idea is that there's an invisible element, which you can call it the life force, whatever you want to, right? And I always kind of make the analogy of, of love, actually. Not lots of little heart with your two hands, that kind of stuff, but the, the true love that we have for each other, life, so on and so forth, that's actually an invisible force. Um, but it is powerful, probably more powerful than anything. And... We all know it exists, but you can't see it, and it's there. So I like to say that there's an invisible force, which is the spiritual reality of human beings that exists. And so that is alive and recognized as being present in each human being. It's not tied to religion, but that it is something more than what we can actually see or sense with our five or 12 senses. And that, I think is wonderful because we trust in that impulse to be present in the lives of the children and an aid to them as well. 
Um, and through pictures and wisdom passed on through narratives from thousands of years, some of those pictures come to life and then can be uh, taken up by students in their own way as individuals throughout their entire lives. So that's, that's how I see it. Does it have a place in Waldorf education? Absolutely. Uh, is it tricky? Yes. Is there dogma that comes in because of it? Yes. Will it last down the road? I don't know. You can't rely on the spiritual impulse of the students or in life to do the teaching for you, and that's not enough. Right? You can't default to that as a, well, let the spiritual world take care of that. That doesn't work in education or in life, actually. We, we have to participate more than that. But it does exist, and it's a really tricky one. Um, I'll stop there. Okay. Chris? Yeah, I agree that, I guess you didn't say this exactly, Pete, but but I think that, to answer the first part of your question, Dave, that spiritual impulse does have to be there. It does have to remain in the, in the Waldorf school if it's truly a Waldorf school. But, but I do see a lot of problems. Um, one of them being that if, if you look more broadly at anthroposophy, which is the belief system that Rudolf Steiner um, came Cre up created, with, created right? yeah. um, it's not just spirituality, but it's specifically esoteric Christianity. And so that, that does present a problem sometimes. Um, if, if schools were to just focus on the spiritual component as Pete described, that's more universal. Um, and and when, when people dig a little bit and they find that, oh, this is connected to specifically Christianity, it's esoteric Christianity, then there, there can be a problem. And, um, and also, you know, you have very cultish, um, very cultish aspects as well, um, having to do, you know, connected with anthroposophy. And so... In schools? Uh, sometimes in schools, um, you know, not, not as much in schools, but it can, it can get there because it's, it's, yeah, it's something that's a part of anthroposophy, I, I, I feel like, or has been spawned by it or exists around it. Um, like the only ideas that ring true are <clears throat> ideas that came from one philosopher a hundred years right. ago, translated exactly. from exactly. German, German from a hundred years ago through multiple translators to the present and interpreted by scholars or whoever. And you know. right, right. That that um, those aren't just ideas to explore, but but those are facts. Um, that everything that Steiner said is is a fact and um, not just a maybe a spiritual path, right? So I think when we read, let's say you know we read about uh, Buddhism, um, I don't think most people take every word that exists as as a fact of you know, a universal fact, it's, it's a way of seeing things. And so, um, so yeah, that, that's, I think, been an issue, particularly with the older generation of, of Waldorf teachers. Um, and I don't know, maybe I'm jaded and maybe, maybe I would be better off having faith in, in those things that, that that's fact, you know, because, there are people who, who don't question those things and, and just take everything that Steiner said as, as fact. And, you know, maybe that's, there's, maybe there's a wonderful freedom in that too. But, um, yeah, I see it as problems. And, uh, you know, how it manifests in a school is um, going to be really unclear. I mean, it's going to be coming up in different ways. And I think... In my experience, 
I, I could never speak my full mind about things because... You mean as a, as a teacher? As a teacher. Um, as a teacher, I could, I could never because it was just a, sort of a, a, um, accepted that, that everything that Steiner said was, was a truth and it was not up for discussion when actually, from what I know, from what I've heard... No. Um, S- Rudolf Steiner, that wasn't Steiner's thing. You know, he yeah. wanted everybody to discuss things. He wanted, he wanted everything to be talked about, worked through, thought about, and explored. Um, it wasn't about dogma. Dogma. Correct. Yeah. So, do you, do you have any concrete examples? I mean, I'm assuming it has something probably related to the sciences, because you're a pretty um, you're a pretty methodical scientific thinker. Uh, and, you know, I know we had had a conversation. We've been talking about, um, um, you know, I've lately been exploring uh, some breathing exercises and Wim Hof breathing. And, and uh, we were talking about whether it's really possible to, to al- alkalize. Is that a word? Al- 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 alkalize. Al- no. al- alkalize. Al- alkalize. 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 To make alkaline <laughs> your body. Yeah. Right. And and um, and you were saying actually scientifically, um, it's probably by deep breathing a few times and holding your breath, that's probably not doing anything on that level that's being claimed to be. But right. maybe it has some other effects. So you feel good. You feel different. Um, and so, you know, you and I were thinking that through and, and you're way better versed in that than I am. But. Do you have any examples of something? Is it something that would come up in a staff meeting or in a, in, you know, and you'd you'd be thinking to yourself, yeah. that's not, that doesn't that's not borne out by the facts. But everyone's going, oh yeah, in the fourth le- le- lecture on knowledge of the higher worlds, there's this, this. It's got to be. It wasn't so much in my teaching. Actually, it wasn't in my teaching at all because it, in a Waldorf High School, the teachers should be free to teach to teach and 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 I felt I was and I did never feel like I had to do anything that somebody was saying is the way to do it in the Waldorf school um I was I was entrusted to teach biology and and um and you know that's what I tried to do so so it wasn't in the teaching but it was more um yeah more in faculty meetings in college meetings um just the the understanding that um yeah just i i don't you know it was never spoken but i felt like if i spoke up with some challenges with um steiner's ideas let's say or something we were reading or um just ideas of of uh, how things were done in a Waldorf school, if I was really challenging some of these things that um, that I would have kind of been, I mean, I don't, you know, now the word canceled is kind of crazy to use, but but in effect that I would be sort of canceled or um, deemed, deemed uh, unsuited to be a teacher in a Waldorf school, actually. That's an, yeah, it's, it's, it sounds like a, there's a risk of groupthink, um, as there is in anything. Um, uh, you know, and yeah. I think I, I, like I'm not a trained Waldorf teacher. I'm, I have not studied anthroposophy. I don't have any interest in, in studying it. But uh, I know that as a, as a student uh, who did 12 years in Waldorf school and then gone on in my life, that um, this, this idea that Albert Einstein espoused, I think he did. Well, he gets, there's a bunch of quotes that are, attributed to him that he never said so I don't know if this is really him but the key thing is to never stop questioning uh, and so you know I think when the questioning stops in any system and anywhere uh, you stop asking the challenging questions then you can slide into that um, the group think and and eventually you're not you're you're part of the problem um, um, so I, I feel like well, I appreciate both of you, um, you know, bringing up, I mean, I appreciate you bring up the cultish piece because um, this isn't to suggest that everyone who's an anthroposophist is in a cult. Um, 
but I want to pivot a little bit or reflect on the fact that indications, spiritual indications that were given 100 years ago in Western Europe uh, by almost entirely white uh, uh, Europeans uh, in a world at, at a time when the world was much less uh, integrated, uh, when Europe was a much less racially integrated than it is today, and and certainly the United States as well. How does that? How do those indications flash forward to 2023 and beyond in terms of um, being able to address the needs of a really diverse society? Or, or do you think well, their schools will continue to be kind of in this primarily white niche, uh, white upper middle class or people who can pay, and maybe that's where they're gonna be doomed to remain. Like, you know, private schools can determine who attends and who doesn't. It's not just having the money, it's there's an interview process, and I know the teacher has a lot of power in determining who comes into the school um, and who's in their grade, et cetera. Uh, who also, people can leave. They can be asked to leave. So there's that dynamic that happens in a private setting that doesn't happen. You know, 90 some odd percent of kids in America are in public schools, right? That's, that's um, where most of them get their learning and you, you teach whoever comes in the door. Um, how do you think about that diversity, uh, multiculturalism, uh, meeting the needs of every kid, whether it's ethnically, linguistically, but also like special learning needs special education, all that stuff in the, in, in, in a Waldorf school. What's been your experience and what do you, where do you think it goes in the future? I know that's a big multi-faceted question. It's the diversity question, diversity in all senses of the word. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll just say a little that, you know, first of all, I mean, I guess the Waldorf school movement as a whole, right, um, spans, I don't know how many countries but quite a few, maybe 50. Um, and I think there's over a thousand Walder schools worldwide. And those Walder schools are in a variety of settings, right? Multiple languages. Um, so, you know, whatever's going on in our neck of the woods or in, in the U.S. I mean, right now we're in Mexico, but, and there's Walder schools all over Mexico as well. Those, those schools are hopefully uh, bringing the richness of the culture, the language, um, and the social norms, et cetera, into those schools and creating community through that, wherever they happen to be. I, I certainly hope that's, that's the case. Um, and so I think that's really, really important. Um, and were, then- Were, Steiner, sorry, were yeah. Steiner's ideas relevant for- um, uh, a, mul a multicultural, uh, diverse population? Good. Excellent question. So I would say yes, when actually fully understood and applied properly, yes. Uh, in the context that they were given, it was a very small slice of the populace, like you said. But that needs to then be taken and applied in other settings and I think that comes down to sort of the human resources and again the counterpoint questions and not taking something verbatim as it was given and then applying it uh, dogmatically or well this is what it was so we're going to try this here you know it's the round peg through a square hole you have to find a way to make it relevant and that's up to the leadership that's up to the training facilities that's up to the teachers in the specific communities. That's up to the parents who support those specific communities and so on and so forth. And through, that, through those means, uh, through, through those methods, I guess I should say, you can make it relevant, but it needs to be really, really understood. Uh, and, and I don't think that it has been adequately enough, but I have had the privilege of seeing Walder schools in other countries and it looks it, where it looks different. So that was nice to see. Um, I would say that the architecture still has a very similar feel and is identifiable because of its uniqueness. I would say that's a commonality. You mean like uh, no right angles and correct, and correct. So um, uh, just as a asterisk, if you know, you can Google Waldorf schools architecture and probably see examples from around the world. But I think that was a Rudolf Steiner indication about because um, he 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 had indications on medicine and architecture and education and 
you name it. Right. Um, agriculture. Agriculture. Yeah. So I think you can, there's a, there's a, even font actually, it seems like there's been a writing font that, that, and that seems to be, I'm sure now it's digital, but, but uh, in other schools all around the world. So it's an interesting thing that that would, that's something that would carry to this day, a hundred plus years into the future. And, and so my understanding about the font quickly is that, so in the Gertianum, which is the center built for anthroposophy in Europe, that the chiseling, yeah, when um, the, the work in the material and the natural material that they were using was done with a series of straight lines, like a chisel and hammer. Oh, instead of a so, curve. Correct. And so because of that, it was a series of parallel lines to create the letters, which was then again, repeated many, many times. So it didn't necessarily, it could have been. It wasn't Walt Rothschild saying, and I am no. thinking that the letters must be many herky jerky little I, angles. I don't, <laughs> I don't think so. So even something like that, yeah. that carries on till yeah. now. And yeah, it's yeah. something that signs, luckily the Santa Fe Walder School sign was not that. It looked. It was just, just courier 12 point font. <laughs> <laughs> just that was all on, that the, the, the sign maker knew how to, how to apply. So, but, but anyway, so I think that that's, um, that's, yeah, that's something. So, um, the, you know, I, I just wanted to do a quick follow-up point if I could about the other idea about the authenticity or the dogma and that sort of thing. Um, that when you're in a Waldorf community, I think as a teacher, there are those people who hold on to their picture of what wall of education should be, which is normal. And then you figure it out. But again, that's to study, that's to point counterpoint. And, you know, I, this little analogy came to mind when you were speaking, Chris and, and Dave, that is when you get a new student who comes to your class and I've introduced, I don't know, hundreds of students coming in. You, the, the one ingredient that I think is, um, the most important for like a seamless integration into the class and social harmony, so on and so forth, there's always gonna be some bumps, is authenticity. Like that student has to be who they look like. They can't come in and act like one thing and really be something else because that's like kind of a form of dishonesty that students don't accept. And then, and then it's really hard for them to kind of get on even footing. I think that same thing for faculty members, right? You wanna come in, you wanna do your best, you wanna strive, but if you're somebody who uses language that, that is colorful, if that's something you decide to do, if, if you have a certain way of being, then that shouldn't be squelched. You should be allowed to express yourself, again, as a counterpoint, and there can be an expectation of a certain way of being, you know, holier than thou even sometimes that is carried through and if you're not that that somehow you're not doing the work and and those two have really not too much to do with each, with each other so the idea that 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 exists is not great and just a little anecdote i had i was at a training in california in sacramento way back in the day probably 20 years ago and somebody came up to me and said um oh you're a, a you know experienced waldorf teacher can i ask you a question i said sure go ahead um and she said, so I heard that if you have a bad thought, that that thought is real and that the children will feel that. And I'm worried because I have many bad <laughs> thoughts and I don't know if I should be a teacher. And I said, you should absolutely be a teacher. <laughs> what the beep are you talking about? And she kind of looked at me like, this guy's crazy. Um, it's, but I, do I have to you beep go. out beeps on this show? <laughs> Maybe. Anyway, that, that's, that's an idea of some of the people attracted well, to this form of education. So I want to I wanna, I wanna talk about that. Not the beep, but the... So I think about this a lot. Like, it, you know, uh, overarching philosophies... Um, uh, paradigms, modes of thinking, um, whether it's religiously based, whether it's something like, <clears throat> in my experience, International Baccalaureate, which is also a framework and a paradigm and, and has a history and has a vernacular and has um, its proponents and detractors and has its vocabulary and has its, uh, you, its you know, some of its commercialized logos and as does Waldorf, they've got the Osna and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it also has the, I, I think this is me editorializing, we run the risk of using it as a foil 
and I'll give an example. I'm not talking about the wind foil that we've been experiencing. <laughs> that's a different, that's much more fun. Uh, a foil of uh, an excuse or something to hide behind. So I've had experiences where, um, you know, we were having at work having a conversation about, well, this, why doesn't this happen? We don't do, why don't we do this? And someone will say, well, where I be? Um, uh, okay. Uh, but what, well, you know, where I be, you know, it covers that. It's like, well, you know, why, or why aren't we celebrating? You know, I remember conversations about why aren't we celebrating, you know, uh, the same, whether it's African American history month or, um, um, Hispanic uh, heritage, whatever, depending on you know, what time of uh, mo- uh, what time of the year it is, etc. And some of the responses are like, "Where I where I be?" It's just it's it's embedded, yeah, you know. It's, it's, and so you think, okay, so is it really embedded? Are we aware that it's embedded? Are we conscious of that? Um, or is that a foil? Is that that a is that a um, just a an easy excuse, something to hide behind and does that happen in the Waldorf world? I mean, I, 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 in my limited experience and in my interactions with, even at my daughter's previous Waldorf school, um, there would be responses to things that would be like, well, what, you know, I, I was always curious about math instruction, for example, like, like where, where, when, at one, what point am I going to get some assessment results so that I can at least see where my daughter is trending before she goes to high school in a public high school and oh well you know and we're well we don't you know yeah, we don't really assess you know and, and i just felt like it was a foil and and i was actually born out uh and my, my theory was born out because <laughs> when we because we had no idea where she was and you know my daughter's very academically capable and was able to catch up and go on has done very well but not every family also has the resources to be able to support a student in that case and and so um do you see sometimes the we are waldorf or that's not waldorf as being like tantamount to the woman going well i've heard that if you have a bad thought i'm like thinking if that's the case <laughs> there would be 0.0 people working in waldorf schools right so then that pretty much today's conversation is over. Oh, oh. I just had a bad thought. I got to turn off. The thing. So do you ever yeah. see that? Do you see that happening? Of course. Unfortunately, that exact thing happens in, in Waldorf schools. I, it shouldn't. Um, and I actually, I think it was maybe the exception at the Santa Fe Waldorf school with certain individuals. Um, I don't recall anything like that happening in in the high school, for instance. But but I know that 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 did occur, and yeah, that's that's not acceptable to the to the parents who are are hearing that. Um, no, because at, at a certain point, at the realities of of a competition and a market especially if you're in the private sector where you're competing with free and other options that may cost more or less and maybe delivering different measurable results uh, and maybe marketing that you know that's a that's a reality I don't know if that's what partially contributed to the Waller school no in in Santa Fe not being in existence, but small schools typically live and die by enrollment. Um, right. You know, that's a tricky thing. Uh, you know. Pete. Yeah. Well, just I mean, so yeah. Thank you. you. You mentioned this idea of well, it's IB. You know, so that's like right there. There's no interrogation. There's there are no interrogatives oh, that follow, yeah. and that's really unhealthy. Yeah. And I was in Denver a few weeks ago, talking to a friend. And we got talking about a lot of different things, and she started talking about Daniel Pink, who's a um, lauded author, an incredible person, New York Times bestsellers, Power of Regret, uh, many amazing books. And are you looking at? Are you googling that right now, Pete? I just wanted to make sure that I had <laughs> what the book was right. I okay. thought he wrote something that was the power. He, beep. he wrote. A, he has a great book, I think, called the uh, something about. Uh, in the right mind or something. He talks about yeah. the power, the, 
the, the fact that the the future will be will be uh, people who are right right brained. Correct. I don't remember. I'm messing Correct. up the name because I'm not cheating now on my Google. So, uh, but anyway, so a whole new mind, a whole new mind. That's what and it is. and right. And yeah. so his whole thing is right. You don't you don't go home on the weekend and do accounting. You go home on the weekend if you want to do something. You know, you play a guitar, you read a book, you run, you work out. You don't go and like crunch numbers. So it's the right left brain thing. Anyway, that's what he was talking about. But my point was that my friend was telling me she had worked with Daniel Pink and knew him and is a friend of his. And I said, he seems like such an amazing guy. And she was like, yeah, yeah. So nonetheless, I said, what's he like? And she said, well, first he's brilliant, super kind. And she said, he's interested in everything. Like doesn't, wouldn't take, would never give a pat and, oh, it's IB or that's just the way it is. Right, right. Really, tell me more. What question, tell me more about that. And I think that has led to him being able to impart so much wisdom. And so nothing stagnates then, right? And there's yeah. always new topics he's taking on and, and talking about. And I think school movements, educational models have to do that. Otherwise they become stagnant and then they're calcified yeah. and, and then they're not alive, right? That life force thing we were talking about is gone and that's a danger. Yeah, I, it was interesting that you bring that up. I was, you know, for the listeners, we've, we've been on this little, uh, this little trip and, um, you know, as brothers, we've been trying to, we don't spend that much time together because we're geographically separated and, and uh, I've been really, in addition to wanting to spend time with my brothers, but fascinated by this concept of um, really taking it one amount of time a year to try to learn something new uh, that's really challenging, that's hard, that's not in our normal wheelhouse uh, where we can do it reflexively. Like we're all at a point in our careers or wherever we are that there's a lot that we do that we've gotten, we've put in our 10,000 hours and we're kind of there and we can, we can, we can do it efficiently um, and effectively, uh, but you know, if we don't, if we if we stop learning, then then we just we don't grow and expand. So today I'm getting my derriere dragged through the water on a <laughs> behind a jet ski as we were both doing alternately, and uh, uh, my instructor uh, shout out to Rodrigo. Go Rodrigo. Uh, go to Rodrigo. Um, he, you know, so we're on a foil. And so to describe it, it's like a, it's almost like an oversized boogie board. And then it has a kind of a rudder, uh, like a post that goes down under the water about three feet. And then there's a, a smaller fin under there that runs parallel to the board. And so when you reach a certain speed and you do some techniques that I was having a tough time doing today, it actually comes up out of the water. And then you have an incredible sensation of flying. And so I was just getting rolled and flipping and falling. And I, the very first time I did exactly what you're not supposed to do, I crashed and I, my face came up and the sharp part of the foil was right in front of my head and all this stuff. And so um, I paused and I'm like floating out there going, I, I may be just too old for this. Like it's like wearing me out and I'm in good shape, but it was, it's all new muscles, all new learning. Uh, I'm overthinking and I'm questioning myself and he comes over and he shuts off the jet ski and he says, Hey, you know, I'm, I just turned 50 and I make a commitment every year. I, I'm either going to learn a new language, I'm going to learn a new sport, or I'm going to learn a new skill. And, and I'm thinking, all right, that's that, that's that trying to learn something and you know we don't all need to carve out time and go to another country to do it either right it's like even i was reading that when if you start brushing your teeth with your left okay. hand as opposed to your right handed <laughs> hand if you're right-handed no seriously or you or you start doing things with the other hand even from a from a biological standpoint it it starts to kind of rewire your brain keeps you flexible I and mean, that's obviously a lot uh, easier to do than to learn a new language or something. Daniel Pink would support that. Too. Yeah, I'm sure he would. He, yeah. In fact, I might have probably stolen it from one of his. Um, <laughs> from one of his. In fact, I'd love to have Daniel Pink on the podcast. He's one of my uh, absolute all time dream guests. So if you can hook it up uh, through your friend to Daniel Pink, Daniel, uh, I'll give you the questions in advance and whatever you 
however long you want to talk or not, we're good to go. Fantastic. Um, I want to, I want to, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about Waldorf education and, and I want to kind of go up on the foil, uh, <laughs> get up out of the water, uh, rise up above a little bit and look more um, globally on a couple questions. You guys have been generous with your time um, <clears throat> already, and I really appreciate that. Um, uh, I just have some questions, kind of philosophical questions, um, and, and see what, you, what your thoughts on, on this are. Um, what does academic rigor mean? Academic rigor. These are these are terms that are thrown out in education in general. Um, either when uh, people are selecting schools for their kids, uh, a certain socioeconomic and, and other education level parents will go. Ah, I need an academically rigor background for my kid, my child. They're going to go on. They're going to do this. I want to make sure they're prepared for the next level. There's, so those are those questions. Sometimes when teachers are being evaluated. There's the questions about academic rigor. Sometimes teachers in the staff room look over at the work that's generated by kids in another teacher's classroom and they think there's either too much or not enough academic rigor. What does academic rigor mean? How do you define it? I think it would have different definitions depending on who you ask. I um, I'm at, Yeah, this is you guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that... For me, uh, teaching high school, I think academic rigor most importantly meant that all of the students could strive for something, that, that even, even the most capable of the students would be interested and engaged and active participants in, in a, a course. Um, I mean that that was most important for me. Um, so really, um, uh, tailoring your instruction to a wide range of uh, uh, learners. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, and some people might say, no, it's all about standards. You know, you have to have a standard, and you have to have a certain amount of homework, let's say, and um, things like that. And that might be part of it, but if half of the class can't is can't rise to that then then there's really no point but um the ones who can they need to keep getting fed um we so, call that differentiated instruction in the public school world yeah and and by the way for listeners you can go back and listen to the Dr. Doug Fisher episode where we talk about the research behind homework and the value of homework and it's um, um, in terms of an effect size uh, on learning outcomes homework has a, has a really small yeah. effect size um, uh, whether it has to do with it, and there's some exceptions there's one about about literacy and reading practice under certain conditions but most of it is um, uh, really really minimal effect sizes that and homework has historically been something that has been, uh, I would call it a, fa a false, uh, a false proxy for rigor. Uh, you know, you can load a kid up with a bunch of stuff, and parents will go, "Oh, Johnny's." I went to bed at eleven, and Johnny was burning them. Yeah, and I was like, "Okay," and he's copying textbook pages on yeah. history. You know, and, yeah, you know, and now he hates history. Congratulations on your <laughs> fake rigor. You know, for damn sure. Uh, or at the the you know lower elementary level, a lot of parents, especially again parents who are educated or par parents who have the time in their work schedule and you got you know parents doing the work for the kids right and so there's there's a lot of those things that happen um, I, so I appreciate that Chris kind of a differentiated uh, access and that's the challenge that's the art mm -hmm. and the science of teaching right? mm -hmm. it's like how do you do that we even, we're even seeing that with the lessons we've been taking right mm -hmm. you know these teachers who we hire to help us learn to kite surf for example and when there's enough wind or do this foiling you know we're we may have more or less ability more you know than other people we're not in our 20s anymore um 
we may overthink things. We may be afraid of getting injured. I know, actually, no, we are afraid of getting injured. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of it too. And they may teach us and then they may go on to a 18 year old who's been, you know, surfing and snowboarding for the last five years and they'll hop right up. Sure. And they also then have to be challenged, right? They can't just tow them around on their stomach like they were doing with us. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What about you, Pete? What, how, how do you define academic rigor without, yeah, without looking it up on Google? Right I'm, now? I'm not looking it up. I'm writing notes while you're talking. <laughs> I'm just kidding. about what to say. Well, so um, I think that's a great, great question. You answered it with the technical term. You said something really good about it. And I just wanted to say this is a little bit, this is like the foil when you're up riding, maybe not quite in the water, but. Um, you know, the difference between like you were saying this attentiveness and engagement. So and it is huge, right? A lot of students are attentive in a classroom, but are they really engaged in the learning process? And same thing with homework. Are they engaged in the learning process while they're doing their homework? Or are they getting it done and not paying any attention and trying to be as efficient as they can? So I think the element of engagement is really important versus just attentiveness or kind of going and doing the bare minimum. And I would say that in an academic sense, that's the same thing. Um, in, in a Walder setting, which is my obviously field of expertise, you have uh, the holistic approach of Walder education gives a lot of opportunity for people to be engaged in a lot of different things, not just kind of passively attentive. And I think that that actually wires them to remain uh, engaged in those things tangentially perhaps but then they can return to them but it also teaches them the difference between true engagement versus just kind of passive attentiveness so I would argue I would say that academic rigor uh, connected to academics specifically is the ability for students to remain engaged which is the job of the teacher and you do that in a myriad of ways um, I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and I appreciate both of your perspectives. It's something that, you know, over my career, especially in the last, in this, uh, the last decade or so, in the, my current role, you know, periodically it'll come up um, or in mission and vision statements or in board comments or, you know, or parent complaints uh, for, uh, there's a lack of rigor. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, everyone's got a different perspective, and as Chris said, a different understanding of what rigor is. Some people, for some people, it's most easily quantified by number of hours that a student spends on on their on their work, um, uh, homework, um, number of pages they need to read, um, etc. And for others, it's you know how deeply they think about things. So it's, a, I, you know, there is no simple, simple uh, answer to this. Um, I just have two more questions right. uh, for both of you. Um, they're reflective questions. They're future facing. Uh, the first one is, what does your 50 year old self or almost 50 year old self in Chris's case, what would your 50 year old self tell your 20 year old self that you wish you'd known when you were 20 like if you could flash back 30 years what would you whisper in your 20 year old self's ear about life about career about teaching about education about um, uh, buying apple stock and in investing in this strange uh company that has a, has a blue has a blue yeah buying the url for google but misspelled by one letter so you can, no. uh at, there's a strange there's a company's going to come out it's a little blue bird eventually it's going to be bought by a guy who's going to change it to an x but before that no it's going to tweet it's going to go okay dude yeah uh, what, what, what would you tell your 20 year old self great question I, a few things come to mind. One of them is simply that 
your hair will go away. <laughs> <laughs> I already knew that at 20. Fabio, what was that guy? That, it, I can't believe it's not butter. It's Fabio. Fa Fabio, yeah, because Chris had the Fabio thing going for a while, remember that? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, one of them would be what you choose to do to make a living doesn't define you. Mm. And so the most important thing to remember is that it's it's the journey that's important, the journey of life. And um, because I think a lot of 20-year-olds, and I certainly did, worry about finding the right the right career, you know, finding the right thing to do and what is it and and then and then once maybe you find it, then how do you get into it and how do you start and all of those questions and and then at the point where I am now that doesn't matter so much and it's more about finding the things that that make me happy and um, s support me and my family and all of that. Um, so yeah, uh, what you do doesn't necessarily define you and who you are and um, the, it's the journey that's important in life. Pete? Wow, that's a hard one to follow, Chris. You can't Google I mean, this, dude. If I, you I, Google I, it, it's going to come out. AI, Google. chat GPT. <laughs> Ten Chad things BBT. my 50-year-old self would tell my 20-year-old self. First of all, First of you all, will feel much older. <laughs> First of all, everything will hurt. <laughs> no. uh, so, I mean, absolutely, that's really well said. Um, I agree entirely with, with those statements. I think I, I would say to myself, look, the, the key to life is not perfection. The key to life is not getting it right quote unquote it's just doing your best again and again and again and know that every time something doesn't go the way that you think you just have to keep pushing through and do your best so definitely that dovetails with it's the journey not the destination there is no destination possible right um it, unless you're talking a specific place in the physical realm. I, I need to get to La Ventana. Okay, we're here. <laughs> um, but but in terms of who we are, that's always changing. And then I think the other thing I would say is, look, the ultimate um, challenge is going to be um, parenting and doing the best you can as a parent uh, for, for your children. Um, because they are the most important uh, beings in your life. And That's what Whitney Houston said. Did she say that? Why don't you Children say that? Children of the future. Day? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that would be something. And then that's where, of course, you do want, then you have to remind yourself it's not perfection as a parent because we all in this room and God all knows. the millions and millions of listeners Wait, if you have a bad podcast, thought, you can't be a parent? <laughs> <laughs> then I would, I'd be out of the race Ooh. before it even started. But 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 in, in all seriousness, right, That that's the hardest one to remember the mantra of. It's not about, you know, being a perfect parent. It's about doing the best and knowing that you are fallible and you're a human being and, and it is the journey. And I'm just grateful for it. And also I would say gratitude is the attitude to employ. And if you have that, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what rap sounds like when you grow up in New Jersey and you're 51. And yeah. No. Um, well, thank you both. I, my last one is this. Um, you know, we've all, we've been exposed to lots of teachers in our lives, um, not all great, um, some damaging, um, some forgotten because they were uh, just unremarkable, and some outstanding because we'll never forget the lessons uh, from them. And wh wh whoever it is, we all have names in our you know, in our minds from elementary school all the way up. We have, you know, and some of them we share, some of them we differ on the, um, on our opinions, you know, of who, of them. And I, I have, you know, 
and some of mine uh, are no longer with us. Uh, Bonnie Chauncey was very influential with me as an English teacher in middle school and in high school. Um, she's no longer with us. Uh, but, you know, the David Sloans, the John Wilsons, the uh, who, here, here. who we had, we had different experiences with them and different times and, um, you know, college professors who we had, coaches who we had, um, uh, et cetera. And we carry, the, you know, we carry those thoughts and impetuses with us, um, whether we're conscious or not. Um, you know, we remember times when they, put their arm on her shoulder and were like, hey, you can do this, I have faith, or that you get tapped for a lead role in a play when you didn't think you, you were the one to do it, or whatever the case is. Uh, how, how would you uh, both like to be remembered by your students uh, 50 years in the future? Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm assuming, you know, you guys are very healthy, but you might not make it to 100, so let's just assume that <clears throat> you tap out at 99. How do you want to be remembered by your students? I, I would like to say that the students have been my greatest teachers along with my daughters. And Susan Flory, Jane Wilson, many, many others, John Wilson as well encouraging me, David Sloan, yes, Lenore Richer. I, I, would, I would say that I want to be remembered as doing my best. Will Kiesel on the basketball court. Will Kiesel on the basketball court. Instead of saying pneumatic, he would say, it's pneumatic. <laughs> it's, I'm not, and all I could think of is, like, what, there's, like, pressure in a cylinder? This play is pneumatic. <laughs> Sorry. And I was going to say Larry Johnson, but that wasn't his name. Remember our art teacher? Larry Johnson was UNLV, a UNLV basketball player. It was Stacy Ogman who came into the league years ago. Larry. I, I remember Chris, his first name. His tall kid, guy. Played yeah. Tall guy, beard, red hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. His kid was we Chris. We mentioned him yesterday. Yeah, it'll yeah. come out. It'll, okay. it'll, maybe we'll put um, it on the show notes. Shout out. Young. Larry Thank Young. Thank you. Not, Larry I'm, Young. I don't know if he. And Larry the, Young. His, and I think, the, and not to, I don't want to cut off your train of thought, but one reason that I even bring this up is because I'm not even sure how many of these people are still with us around, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. so life goes by quickly. Sure. Uh, so, so, right. So all those people I mentioned, the classes I've taught, uh, the, the students who taught me, but I think I, I would like to be remembered as being somebody who was, excuse me, striving to do my best, fallible, interested, engaged, and... Occasionally with a bad thought. <laughs> Occasionally with a bad thought or two, but really wanted to show that, that enthusiasm and engagement in the lives of others and in social interactions is where uh, I feel fortunate and, and I hope that they, all the people I've touched, my students would say, okay, I want to be enthusiastic and engaged in a similar level to how Peter Shermetta was. Chris? Yeah, hopefully they'll remember me as being supportive and encouraging and also as someone who was excited to learn alongside them and that they could see learning with them and someone who um, yeah, maybe opened opened some doors to them in terms of bringing something that they was new and exciting and interesting to them sometimes. Well, I, I want to thank both of you. Um, I'm not suggesting you're not going to make it to 100, uh, but I do appreciate that and the conversation today and... Um, it's really been a uh, uh, privilege to have both of you on the Hangout and to spend this time together, and uh, hopefully we can do it, do it again soon. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks. Chris. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, both of you.
Thank you for listening to the Superintendent's Hangout. You can follow me on Twitter at DVS1970. Please be sure to share this show with friends and family on social media and in the real world. Thank you to Brad Bacchial for editing and production assistance and to Tina Royster for scheduling and logistics. Thanks for hanging out and have a great day. Thank you.